We're headed into a difficult time. There's no question about that. It's, I mean, if people want to think of an, a historical analogy, they should think of the Great Depression. Uh, but sometimes hard times can, can bring out the best in people as well as the and worst. And bring us together. It's been pointed out that Americans love a challenge. Well, this is a challenge. <laughs> and, and it's... It, they do like, it's not just that they, love, they like challenges, they like rising to them. And so this is something that actually, that actually may well bring out the best in local people. And there's plenty of history to show that, that the American nation is quite good at rising to this sort of thing. So I hope that's this is Peak Moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. Both of my guests today speak frequently to folks about peak oil and energy vulnerability and what can we begin to do about it. So I'm very pleased to invite you to join me in meeting Richard Heinberg, who's an instructor and professor at New College of California and the author of The Party's Over and Power Down and soon to be The Oil Depletion Protocol. And Julian Darley, who's the author of High Noon for Natural Gas and the co-founder and director of Post Carbon Institute. Actually, I'm just the founder. I'm the founder and director. And the director. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both for being here. I'm really glad to have you on our, our show. Let's take a look at energy vulnerability first. You, Richard, have been talking a lot about oil in particular and you natural gas. To a lot of folks, where are we on this? I mean, is it really a slim stage here? Mm -hmm. Give us a word about that. Yeah. Well, it's a, a, a fairly dire situation, uh, to tell you the truth. Uh, we have created a society overwhelmingly dependent on fossil fuels, and this has happened just over the last 150 years, just an eye blink of historical time. Uh, but in that short time, we've, we've created planes, trains, automobiles, and redesigned cities and countries so that they can operate only in the, this context of cheap energy. Meanwhile, the stuff that we're using for this fossil fuel fiesta is rapidly running out. It's, it's a non we're talking about non-renewable resources, uh, coal, oil, and natural gas. And oil is, has been uh, extremely important, especially for transportation and also industrial agriculture. And we're, we're bumping right up against the point of what's being called peak oil, the time when we reach the all-time uh, maximum rate or flow of, of oil. That doesn't mean we're actually running out. That's not going to happen for decades. But um, we've been seeing declining oil discoveries since about 1964. And uh, all of the this giant and super giant oil fields that we rely on for about half of our current uh, oil production globally are reaching their, their stage of maturity. Um, there are places like Gawar in Saudi Arabia and Cantarell in the Gulf of Mexico and Burgan in, uh, in Kuwait uh, were all discovered back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. We're just not finding those super giant oil fields anymore. And as those go into decline, it's difficult to impossible to replace their, you know, two million barrels a day, five million barrels a day, three million barrels a day with much tinier oil fields that produce maybe a few tens of thousands of barrels a day, of which we have to find hundreds and thousands to, to, to make up the difference. So it's an accelerating treadmill, the oil industry falling behind, and we're going to reach the, the global peak probably within the next two or three years. Well, you, we are not going to just be able to adapt and go to something else, right? I mean, there's this gap between we run to the peak. What do we have to replace that? And uh, and it's it's is and how soon? Right. Uh, well, s soon Im immediately because uh, we're not talking about a, uh, something that can be replaced overnight, uh, even in the best of circumstances. Because we, as I said earlier, we've created all this industrial infrastructure that only runs on the kinds of fuels that that uh, that we've been accustomed to. 
Uh, so immense investment will be required and uh, enormous lead times, 10, 20 years of, of work to begin to replace the fuels that we have. And even then, there are physical constraints with regard to any of the, uh, of the replacements that are being uh, considered, such as biofuels, uh, coal to liquids, gas to liquids. Uh, there really aren't that many options in terms of, of liquid transportation fuels. If people are th thinking, for example, of, of nuclear or solar and wind, these are all sources of electricity. And we don't have lots of cars in this country that run on electricity, they run on liquid fuels. So over the longer term, we, could, we can talk about uh, transitioning, say, to hydrogen, which we make using electricity and water, but that's going to require an enormous amount of, of water, and there are a lot of technical problems with hydrogen. So all of this boils down to saying, over the short term, there aren't any easy supply side solutions. We're going to have to look primarily at reducing demand for transportation fuels. Reducing demand. This does not sound like a fun and easy project. I mean, this well, doesn't, uh, you know, the things that localities have to think about is using less, yes? Right, Conserving, exactly right. efficiency. Mm -hmm. Julian, um, what kinds of things, uh, we can talk about alternatives or renewables. What are, what are communities starting to do? Those are at the edge who are aware of this. What are they starting to do and think about and in terms of responding to this, this very narrow window? Um, communities are starting to respond to this. Um, the first thing to say is that the first response is, what can I do as an individual? But what um, we're trying to do, um, especially a, a good deal of Post Carbon Institute's work, is, is to help people to understand that as an individual, you can do certain things, but you can only do so much. And once you have cut down certain things, I mean, you can reduce your car use, you can actually get rid of it completely if you're, if you're willing to do certain things, it can be done, um, hard though it is, and you can cut down your um, flesh content. It sounds a little bizarre, right? I mean, the, the amount of meat and fish you eat, at least that sort of flesh, anyway. Because, of course, um, that takes a lot. I mean, we're also looking that's... at foods that are transported long distances. Yeah. So you're talking about reducing and so on yeah, individually. Yeah, these, these the, the individual level. Um, you soon bump up against a certain limit. I mean, if you do some of those things, you will reduce your energy demand and you can insulate your house or you know, get houses which are, uh, be part of a household which is with houses joined together. But that leads one into the idea of, of the fact that, oh, wait a minute, that sounds like an infrastructural change. For instance, most houses that you see in North America are not designed to be joined together. I mean, they aren't. I mean, we had in, in Britain and, and Europe, we have row houses and ter terraced houses which are already joined together. And there are huge heat savings to be made by doing that, as well as they're, they're more dense. Um, they're usually at least two or three stories, that kind of thing. And um, in older cities and towns, they can be up to seven stories. Mm. So you've got shops at the bottom, you can have offices above that, and you have people living above that. And the whole thing is extremely dense, and then it's wrapped around um, squares and wrapped around streets, so you don't get this sort of linear, long strip mall effects. It's more the fact that it's more like a honeycomb. Everything's joined together, everything's wrapped around, um, and you, so you have a, a fairly dense center where people live and work and shop and, and do things and make things and so forth. And that's really utterly different from most of what you find in North America, which is why the response, the, the deeper response has to be at the community and the municipal and the local government levels so that you can start to make infrastructural changes. Retrofitting infrastructure is not a trivial operation, to put it extremely mildly. Um, Infrastructure takes years and decades to plan and to build, and ultimately, when you're looking at a whole nation, billions and trillions of dollars. And so this is, this is quite frankly, a, a worrying situation, that when you're going to make serious um, energy reductions, uh, energy demand reductions, the using much less part, as Sweden, for instance, which is committed to being uh, fossil fuel free by 2020, Sweden is a very interesting and one might hope paradigmatic country to look at, but they've already spent 35 years reducing their energy footprint and their energy demand, and a lot of it's been infrastructural. And they have district heating, and they've, their buildings are already close together, which makes all this possible. Just a question, what's district heating? Tell me what that is. District heating is, um, the modern version of it is now you have um, a 
a pipe which delivers um, 200 degree, 200 Fahrenheit degree um, water into the system and through a large pipe, and then it's it's piped out into the local buildings, um, pumped pumped into them, and so all their heating is done. So it's by for space heating. Is yes, that right? For, Centralized space heating yes, of the buildings. It's, it's, okay. It heats buildings. Space heating is the technical term for it. It heats buildings, and you can also in, in other places you also have a cooling pipe as well. It's it's not so necessary in Sweden most of the time. <laughs> um, district heating gives you a dramatic reduction in the amount of energy that you spend heating places. But one of the things you notice is a it's highly infrastructural. You have to dig holes in roads and put these pipes in one, you then need combined heat and power because this is mostly where the heat comes from. So if you're burning something, in their case, often biomass from their very large forests, they take a small amount of that. So you're burning something to make power, to make electricity, you take the waste heat, and amongst other things, you can then heat the water through a ex heat exchanger, then pipe it down these large pipes to these um, uh, building clusters which are close together, and then you warm them, you do the space heating that way. It's, it all has to be planned, all the infrastructure has to be meshed in together, you need to have all the right regulatory agreements, all the right zoning, um, the whole thing is absolutely feasible, it's done in Austria and Germany and even a little bit in Britain, there's one city that's doing it in Britain, in Sweden, in Norway, in Finland, in Denmark, you can just list them off, um, but it takes a, takes years to do, it and takes planning. And you're starting, you're starting with communities, as you pointed out, that weren't shaped based on oil. Yeah. I mean, our American sprawling suburbs, I can't, I can't, has anybody even attempted to picture how do you retrofit houses, you know, with our separate yards, with, mm -hmm. you have to use a, you know, that already have the sewer, as you say, the structure, infrastructure is already in there. It feels to it's, me a it's daunting It's an extraordinary project. challenge. Uh, there, there are s some advantages to starting with our, our uh, current infrastructure. They're, they're few and far between, but uh, <laughs> for food production, for example, um, if, if you look at all of the American lawn space and how many garden vegetables could be grown in not just in people's backyards, but front yards as well, that could actually make a difference. And food production is an, uh, an area of great vulnerability because right now, um, the average uh, food item uh, an American eats is grown several hundred, sometimes 1,500 miles away. Uh, and, and also, it's typically grown using an enorm enormous amounts of fossil fuel, fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, pumped water, and so on. So those energy inputs are, are uh, not something we can take for granted in the future. Already, many American farmers are, uh, are are going out of business, are losing money, can, don't know how they can afford to plant this year's crop just because of high uh, fertilizer prices, and of course fertilizer made from natural gas, which is in decline in North America, and also high diesel and gasoline prices for all of their, their farm equipment. So we're, we are going to need more uh, human involvement, more personal involvement in food production in this, in this country and in the world in, as a whole. So we'll use our, our suburbs to you know take the fences down and put in our orchards and our our our, our produce at least That's I'm right. not sure and chickens but I, I can just see it now you know the cul-de-sacs that have got raising their cattle or or <laughs> wheat or something this could be really challenging and, and some of these uh, modern you know uh, uh, McMansions that that uh, have been built in the last uh, ten years or so I and mean, the average uh, size of an American house has increased from ten, uh, a thousand square feet to two. Uh, to 2,000 square feet over the last uh, uh, 30 years or so. Um, ultimately, I think they're going to be good for, for uh, two or three families living together. I think it's going to perhaps be the only economical way to do, yeah. to do that, is to have the extended families. What other kinds of activities, what are, what are some of the localities doing? I mean, they're starting to face the, I mean, infrastructure is one thing. Even acknowledging that we have a problem is has got to be a starting place, and many communities are not even, it's not on the radar screen yet. Mm. What about those communities that are? What are they starting to say and do? Um, an encouraging um, advent is that of um, communities uh, getting peak oil resolutions passed by their 
their local government um, organizations. And there have been several of those lately, starting with San Francisco, and there was recently one with, in Portland just a few weeks later. And this is coming up more and more often now. And um, getting a peak oil resolution passed, which basically says the city council, the municipality, recognizes that this peak oil phenomenon is not just a theory, it's an, it's an observation, observation and something happening in practice. And by the way, it might be happening now, and it has some fairly dire consequences. Um, and often it comes along with um, a resolution to actually convene some kind of uh, a planning organization to look at some strategies um, and so forth. Um, this is really quite significant because once you get uh, elective representatives to put this on the books in some way, then newspapers can refer to it, other councillors can, can refer to it, citizens can refer to it, and you can't very well rescind it. It's very hard to remove um, something once yes. it's been put on the books, especially if it's turning out to be true. So actually, peak oil resolutions um, are, I think, a, a very useful, powerful tool, which um, it's quite clear that, that um, local citizens could do, because as far as I know, uh, most of the ones I know of have all been put in place by local citizens, and, and not many of that. Um, and increasingly, we're, we're offering templates. Um, Post Garden Institute will, uh, is, will work with municipalities anywhere in the world and um, with citizens to put these um, resolutions into place. So I think that's one thing that the more aware communities, well, I know that's one thing that the more aware communities are doing, and that is, that's finding fertile ground now because so many councillors and uh, elected representatives themselves are increasingly becoming aware of this, and so it makes it much easier. So um, I imagine that one's going to have the conversation that somebody who's an elected representative say, I can't really say this, but you citizens, you come forward and you do it, that makes my job easier. And I know this goes on from, from other political work, is that they that politicians need the public. They'll often say, and there's some justice and truth, uh, some truth in this, whether there's any justice is another matter, but there's some truth in it, that they need the public to come forward and say, we want this, because they are, after all, elected representatives. Right. And it's people call for leadership from the top all the time. It's a tricky business, and they know it. There is also the phenomenon that um, many people in, uh, in, in elected positions don't want to be the first. Mm -hmm. if, the, if the groundswell from the grassroots says, you need to pay attention to this because we need to make sure we're covered, mm. or at least thinking about mm. it, I imagine that support is what they need, that as support. well as other communities doing it. And there is also other communities doing it. I mean, many places would like to be the 201st, not the first <laughs> to be doing something. And people have actually said that to yes. me. Um, Relocalization has a lot of benefits to it. And from the elected representative point of view, um, talking about the, the new creation of local manufacturing, of local energy harvesting, of local food production, and all the, the um, as if you like, the relocalization of ownership of stores and, and other sort of emporia where we, where, we, where we do trade and transaction and making things, that has enormous possibilities. It's just it's pretty tricky at the moment where we're at the sort of the zenith of globalization. Um, which means there's very little of that capacity at the moment. It is not going to be frightfully easy to bring it back, but it's been pointed out that Americans love a challenge. Well, this is a challenge, <laughs> and, and it's... It, they do like, it's not just that they, love, they like challenges, they like rising to them. And so this is something that actually, that actually may well bring out the best in local people. And there's plenty of history to show that, that the American nation is quite good at rising to this sort of thing. So, I hope that's still so a strong part of our fiber because yeah, it looks like the challenge has arrived for us. It's, mm -hmm. it's and there's actually challenge. a couple of good challenges actually yeah. here because there's also climate change. That's I mean, right. in a way, your news about are coming to the peak of oil would be could be seen as a blessing. Well, I, I think that the, the the problem is best stated as a fossil fuel problem, uh, the problem of dependence on fossil fuels and the problem of what happens when we when we use them, uh, and the the solution for peak oil and the solution for for climate change is uh, in, in generally the same thing, which is to uh, reduce our, our addiction to, our reliance on fossil fuels. How we do that is very important. Uh, for example, we, we could just look at peak oil in isolation as a problem and say, well, uh, there's lots of coal out there, and we know how to turn coal into liquid fuel, and the Germans did it during World War II, uh, South Africans are doing it now on a small scale. So all we have to do is build 
hundreds of new coal to liquids plants and, and start mining coal in enormous quantities and the problem solved. But of course, if we do that, uh, the consequence will be uh, <laughs> virtually the end of the world as we know it as a result of climate change. I mean, climate change is already, uh, climate chaos, I prefer to call it, is al already an enormous problem and it's going to continue to be. Uh, even, if we, even if we stopped burning fossil fuels today, the amount that we've burned so far has set a process in motion that's not going to be difficult, not going to be easy to, to contain. So uh, how we deal with peak oil is very important. Uh, and I think it's, it, it's extremely important that we see it as uh, reducing demand for fossil fuels rather than just fuel switching. With regard to coal liquefaction, coal to liquids, um, it's not a subject for future discussion. It's already happening. Right. Um, Montana, for instance, and, and other places um, are home to large um, coal deposits, and they're already very interested in talking to people like Sassol um, about converting coal into liquids. And so it's, you know, it's already happening. There's a vast raft of new coal-fired power stations coming on stream now that it's been realized that natural gas is, uh, is not the way to go. Um, so coal, unfortunately, is the, is the rising king once again, as it, as it was, with how Britain started its industrial revolution with coal. So this is uh, the challenge of the, the, the new rise of coal and indeed the renewed rise of nuclear is very, very serious. Um, I don't think it's going to go quite as easily as, as the coal and nuclear uh, lobby would have us believe. Um, they're touting what I uh, call the cyanide solution. The chemical formula for cyanide is C plus N or CN. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it is a poison pill, but of course it does produce energy. There's no question about that. And some of the reasons why I don't think it's going to be so easy. For coal, um, I think that climate change, climate chaos um, is is now happening so fast that there may start to be some pressure on the coal regime such that it can't go as fast as it wants. And there, and there are practical problems involved too. I mean, coal starts out as a less energy dense material than oil and then the, 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 the chemical process that, we, that has to be used to turn it into a, a liquid fuel uh, costs an enormous amount of, of the energy content. And then if we try to uh, mitigate the, the climate change problem with, with carbon sequestration, there's an energy penalty there too. So the, the scale of coal mining uh, that would have to go on if we were to go down that road of, of coal to liquids would be absolutely enormous. And uh, frankly, I think the technical capability of doing that is, is simply not there. Let's go to, in our last five minutes here, let's take a look at one of those tough nuts about our energy pro, you know, problem is transportation, right? Mm -hmm. Liquid fuels. And you're talking about reducing demand. What kind of possibilities should, could, could municipalities, could cities, towns be thinking about instead of our gridlocked cars running on gas? Mm -hmm. What else is possible? Um, for, for municipalities, rail-based public transport such as North America used to have, but was torn out. Light, ra um, light rail, electrified rail, yep. Yep, that's the best yep. option, no yep. question. If you have metal rails, it's so much easier to electrify it. You can have rubber wheeled buses, trolley buses. They're common in Europe. We have them in Vancouver. They're in some other places but those, in North America. But those, those tires are, are made out of petroleum. The tires are made out of petroleum. Um, it's so much better if you have railed public transport. Um, it allows you to do your uh, city planning around certain corridors. It means you can keep away sprawl. You, you basically don't need to have sprawl if you have, if you have metal rails. Um, it's much easier to make um, the cars and the locomotives. They're, they're, they can be made more simply. We used to make them um, out of basically glass, steel, and wood, and you can keep repairing them. The electric motors are much simpler. It's a very old technology. Well, some, so. some of these things are still, that were built in the 1890s are still running. Some of the ones made in Britain, I think, are still run, running in Lisbon because they can be repaired. The other thing, uh, that's something that municipalities can do above all, um, and local government can get involved in, in rails, both, the, both rails between cities, uh, interurban, and 
um, light rail and trams and streetcars within a city. Something that, that is really wonderful that can happen, especially if the municipality will become involved, is car sharing. It's something that communities can do on their own without municipalities. It's so much easier if local government gets on board and helps. And car sharing allows you to cut the amount of uh, car ownership by a factor of up to about 20. And you can reduce car miles driven by a factor of about 10. And what it means is that um, people don't have to lose access to mobility when they need it. They just have access to a car by the hour instead of sitting at the bottom of their drive all the time. It has a dramatic effect on the way you see your community. It encourages you to start walking. It's a bit of effort to do this. Mm -hmm. You have to start walking and using bicycles and um, using public transit. It's much easier if you have reasonable pub public transit to do car sharing. So I think it's one of the major things we should push, be pushing is railed public transport and car sharing. I, I think that I'm thinking about the rural area that I live in, in which um, in which we've got hilly, hilly direct areas that aren't and a, a large retired community, so they're not going to be as prone to jump on their bicycles and go from town to town over the hills for the effort that's required. But something like light rail between our two main towns and the car sharing, I think that's going to be probably the most, um, uh, what would I say, an option that's going to look more favorable to many people right. it's for a transition. Also, uh, for, over the short term, building light rail systems is going to take time and investment. Over the short term, we're going to have to use the vehicle fleets that we have, but use them much more efficiently. And that means uh, community-supported hitchhiking. It means uh, taking those SUVs and turning them into taxis that we coordinate with cell phones. So we're picking up people on routes all over the place. So people can still do their essential transportation, but do it in a way that uses maybe a tenth the, the amount of, of gasoline. And what you're really talking about is we're going to start sharing. That's right. We're going to have to start cooperating with each other. We're not going to be able to be off on our separate little lives in our little metal boxes on wheels as yeah. much as we've been doing. Sharing can get energy demand and indeed material demand dramatically down by a factor of 10 or more literally overnight. If you start sharing one item amongst 10 people where previously 10 people had a single item, you reduce demand um, by nearly a factor of 10. Of course you use the item a little bit more but frequently not very much more. So sharing is, is going to be an extraordinarily important thing. We humans can do it but we will need to change some of the ways we think about certain things, and there's no question that it causes us to occasionally to get scrappy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that uh, we, we may get scrappy, and I think there's going to be bumps up and down on this. It's not no. going to be the smooth road to... Yeah, to we're he we're to headed into a difficult time. There's no question about that. It's, I mean, if people want to think of an, a historical analogy, they should think of the Great Depression. Uh, but sometimes hard times can, can bring out the best in people as well as the and worst. And bring us together yeah. in real ways. Thank you so much for being my guest on Peak Moment. This is Jenea Donaldson, and you've been watching Peak Moment, Community Responses to a Changing Energy Future. Thanks for watching.